Citadel Band and Songsters and the Holly and the Ivy. Very appropriate that we have the Citadel Band because my guest this morning is General Eva Burrows of the Salvation Army. You've got some wonderful musicians in the Salvation Army, haven't you? Thank you, Roger, very much. And certainly at Christmas time, they play out in the streets and everyone can enjoy the lovely Christmas music from the band. Oh, it's so exciting. But what Christmas message have you got for us on this Christmas Eve? Well, it's Christmas Eve and it's Sunday which means if you've left uh, your presents till now, you're too late because there are now no shopping days before Christmas. You know, I heard about one woman who was uh, hectically busy buying Christmas presents and all the food needed for the Christmas celebrations when she suddenly remembered she'd forgotten to send Christmas cards to her friends. So she dashed out to a stationery shop and seeing a Christmas card with a nice picture, she said, oh, I'll have 40 of those. And she hurried home and soon had them posted off. A couple of days later, she was looking at the few cards that still remained. What a shock she received when she actually read the verse in the card, which she'd not even noticed before. It said, This card comes just to say, a little gift is on the way. (laughs) So all those disappointed friends are still waiting for that promised gift. Fortunately, it wasn't like that with God's promised gift to the world. He kept his promise. Long, long ago, the Jewish prophet spoke and wrote about that promised gift. Like the prophet Isaiah, who said, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. Yes, God promised a gift to the world, and that gift was his son, Jesus Christ. On that first Christmas day, God's son was born in Bethlehem. He came to bring peace, justice, freedom and goodwill among men. He came to make the world a better place, to show men how to live. You know, that day when God's promised gift came to the little town of Bethlehem was the greatest day in the history of the world. And the gift turned out to be even more wonderful than the promise. I remember listening to a program on the radio one day with the interesting title, Promises and Reality. It was about the United Nations organization, showing how the stark reality has turned out to be so different from the promises, so disappointingly different. For example, the promise that famine would be wiped out and all the world would be fed, and the reality, so different, as again we see the possibility of millions dying of hunger in Ethiopia. The United Nations promised peace in our time, yet conflicts and civil wars still rage all over the globe from Lebanon to El Salvador. The reality is so disappointingly different from the promise. It's always like that with mankind. Promises, 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 we say. But how different with God? The reality turns out so much more wonderful than the promise. No wonder the wise men coming from eastern lands brought splendid gifts to present to the Christ child. No doubt they were surprised to find the star that guided them had stopped over a humble cattle shed. 
No doubt they were surprised that the end of their searching was a baby lying among the straw in the food box of the animals. But they entered that low door and they worshipped the Christ child. They were not too proud to enter that humble place. They fell down and worshipped Jesus. And wise men and women still do. Westminster Abbey Choir with Sir Harry Seacom, Happy Christmas Harry, and Away in a Manger. And with me still is General Eva Burrows. General, you were talking about promises and realities. Mm. You've had wonderful news from the East recently, haven't you? Yes, really. Well, you know, Roger, the Salvation Army was banned in all the communist countries. And we're beginning to see that the doors are opening. And we were amazed because the Hungarian state television said they'd like to do a series of Christmas stories on television in Hungary about the Salvation Army. So they Marvelous. came and spent a week with us here visiting Where did you our, take them? We went, they went on the soup run and great. they went to our Centres for Homeless People. And they even went to a great carol service conducted by the Salvationists at Croydon in the Fairfield Halls. This is so, when you pack the Fairfield Halls for three consecutive concerts. That's right. right on the Sunday. Sunday, last yeah. Sunday. So it really was, is quite exciting and we're praying that God will guide us as we seek to enter again into those parts of Eastern Europe. Because it's a very important opportunity. I mean, it's one that can't be wasted, isn't it? Oh, the doors are open in, in a wonderful way yeah. and, and this new light of freedom is like the star from the East shining all over again, isn't it? Have you been encouraged by other things within this country during this last year or well, I, th great concerns. I think we are very concerned about the situation. You know, uh, next year is a hundred years since William Booth wrote his definitive social book called Darkest England yeah. and the Way Out. And we're doing a study of the situation in Britain today. 
And really, we have to say, for many people, the situation is not too d different nowadays. But we thank God for a lovely thing, and that so many people are concerned for their neighbours, for their, those of their own f countrymen who are suffering difficulty, unemployment and poverty. And the soup run goes on night after night after night. That's right, here in London. and I was on it just recently. And I also was walking on the stations in London because we have a... A couple, a man and woman, who walk the stations to see if they can find youngsters, mm. uh, particularly who are stranded in London or just come to London hoping for the bright lights. And uh, then they, they pick them up and take them to our little shelter in King's Cross and then see that they get home. Do you know that one, not so long ago, a little boy of six, would you believe it, was picked up on the station and uh, they found out that he knew his home telephone number. They phoned his parents and the parents said, oh, I think you've got it wrong, he's in bed. So they said, but he's given us your phone number. And when they went upstairs, he wasn't in bed. He'd yeah. got out of bed, got on the train and come to London because he'd been very upset about something. It's very worrying, isn't it? It's amazing. Have you a prayer for us on this Christmas Eve? Yes, Roger. Please. Let's pray together with all those who are listening this morning. Dear Lord, we really are happy that it's Christmas, not just because of the family joy, but because of your wonderful gift of Jesus, our Saviour and friend. Lord, we offer you the gift of our own worship and love, and we pray that you will bless every family listening this morning. May they sense a deep awareness of your presence this Christmas time. Lord, we pray for the lonely, the sad, the homeless, the wanderers. May their contact with caring Christian workers this Christmas bring to them an awareness of your loving touch in their lives. Lord, we thank you for the new shining star of freedom in the east of Europe, and we pray that your spirit will encourage and guide in the future planning in those lands. Lord, make us all aware of those victims of poverty and hunger, victims of war and violence, victims of the political power game who suffer untold misery. Make us ready to do all we can to alleviate their distress. Lord, we know you're listening. Do answer our prayer. Amen. Amen. General Eva, thanks very, very much indeed, and a happy Christmas to you and all the members of the Salvation Army. And a happy Christmas to you amongst the snows in Lapland. That's very kind of you. Later today... This lunchtime, Radio 2 shares some memories of another Christmas when things were very different. The children have gone, the blackouts snuffed the brilliant Christmas lights, but even so, there's plenty going on. There's gaiety still, lots of it, irrepressibly bursting through the blackout. 1939, remembered at one o'clock. After which Richard Stilgo argues convincingly that there's no such thing as an original piece of music. Take the song, Yes, We Have No Bananas. Now that song has only three original notes in it. And in fact, the middle one, no, that one, is used by Bach over 5,000 times. <laughs> Tonight, you're invited to spend another Christmas at Altrup with the Earl Spencer. I've chosen many of my favorite pieces of music, which I hope you will also enjoy. And then to lead into the big day tomorrow, carols from the magnificent Chapter House of York Minster, Christmas Eve on Radio 2. Christine Morris of Hemel Hempstead, many thanks for your letter and very many happy returns of the day. And willingly, I'll say thank you to all those friends who've been so helpful to you over the past 25 months. Here's Nat King Cole. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire Jack Frost nipping at your nose Yuletide carols being sung by a choir And folks dressed up like Eskimos Everybody knows A turkey and some mistletoe Help to make the season bright Tiny tots with their eyes all aglow We'll find it hard to sleep tonight They know that Santa's on his way 
He's loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh And every mother's child is gonna spy To see if reindeer really know how to fly And so I'm offering this simple phrase To kids from one to ninety-two Although it's been said Many times, many ways Merry Christmas to you From one to ninety-two Although it's been said Many times, many ways Merry Christmas To Nat King Cole and the Christmas Song. The hymn that takes us up to the 8 o'clock news is the wonderful Advent, because we're still in Advent, the Advent hymn sung by King's College Choir Cambridge, and it's on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Cry. Gwen Eden of Warwick, I was so pleased to get your card. I remember that your husband died earlier this year, but you're just wanting to say thank you very much indeed for all those people who've been great support to you. And for those of you who, for whom this is the first Christmas without a partner, we're especially thinking of you at this time, and I know that you will be supported. And let's also think of new life. My lady who keeps me clean on a Tuesday, Doreen, was celebrating this week because she's got a new granddaughter, Holly. Holly, welcome to this world and have a very, very happy first Christmas.
The news at 8 o'clock on Sunday the 24th of December. Good morning, this is Richard Clegg. Fierce fighting has broken out again in the Romanian capital, Bucharest. The city had been quiet for several hours during the night, but there have been renewed clashes in the city centre between pro-democracy troops and security police loyal to the deposed President Nicolae Ceausescu. However, the organisation leading the uprising, the National Salvation Front, says it's in control of all the strategic points in the country. The former president and his wife are said to be under arrest. There are also reports that the security police in a town near the Soviet border have surrendered. From Bucharest, our correspondent Mark Brain. As dawn broke in Bucharest, it seemed that after two days of heavy fighting, the guns had at last fallen silent. But shortly before nine o'clock local time, that's one hour ago, the Securitate showed that in central Bucharest, they had not yet given up the fight. As I speak now, the sound of gunfire to the south around the telephone exchange and the central committee building has again subsided. And a few minutes ago, as I made my way back to the hotel, army tanks that had been positioned on the central palace square moved out across the city. The tanks were friendly, and their redeployment out across Bucharest suggests possibly some confidence that the new leadership here is securing its military hold against the Securitate. From the town of Yash in the Romanian northeast near the Soviet border, Bucharest Radio says the secret police have now laid down their arms and surrendered. Across the border to the west in Hungary, the military situation in Romania is being monitored particularly closely. Fighting continued into the night in the western city of Timisoara, where members of the security police, or Securitate, landed by parachute. For the past few hours, the city has been relatively quiet. The army is in control of all the major buildings, including the television and radio station, telephone exchange, post office and factories. A Romanian Air Force jet has been flying overhead. Jane Peel reports from Timisoara. Off from Timisoara's military airfield and is flying around the town in an attempt to protect it from attack by the Securitate. Up to now, the air force here had been grounded because their fuel was in the hands of the Securitate. Now I'm told the armed forces who are loyal to the people have regained control. The jet is flying in circles around the town and hopes to prevent more security police dropping in by parachute. Last night, three helicopters brought in members of the Securitate to support the guerrilla offensive against the soldiers. Fighting lasted for several hours. The casualties included four journalists who were wounded, one of them seriously. None were British. It's feared that many thousands of people have died during a week of unrest in Romania. The British Red Cross Society has launched an appeal for funds to supply the country with desperately needed medical supplies. Many countries have offered medical aid, including Britain, which has promised a tonne of supplies. The International Committee of the Red Cross is helping to coordinate the operation, and the British Red Cross has already contributed £100,000. The first plane load of supplies is expected to leave Britain sometime today. The director of the International Division of the Society, Mr David Wyatt, explained what was being sent. What is needed above all is medical assistance. The country is absolutely shorn of all blood plasma, um, dressings, drugs. And we're getting the money together in order to provide that for the many thousands of injured people. So it's a dreadful bloodbath with terrible casualties many many thousands injured it's going to go on for a long time needing help from the international community the british public are phenomenally generous they always give uh, until it hurts and i know they're going to do that this time the british red cross society has opened a telephone line for donations the number is 01200-0202 that's 01200-0202 at the United Nations, Britain, France and the United States have all vetoed a Security Council resolution which strongly criticised America's military intervention in Panama and demanded the withdrawal of US troops. And in Panama, the new government has announced the formation of a security force, a thousand strong, to restore law and order to the capital Panama City. Two Irishmen are to appear before Bow Street magistrates in London on Boxing Day charged with conspiracy to cause explosions and with possession of a firearm with intent to resist arrest. The two, who've not been named, were detained on Thursday near a cache of arms and explosives in Duffet. 
And the weather, rain over northern and western areas will spread to most other parts. There's a warning of gusts up to 70 miles an hour over southwest and northwest England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And that's the news at five past eight. Good morning, Sunday. Radio 2. Roger Royal. Hello and welcome back to Good Morning Sunday. Coming to you from London, but tomorrow I shall be in Lapland. But as Sammy Davis Jr. sings... It's Christmas time all over the world And Christmas here at home The church bells chime wherever we roam So try a Noel, Benny, To you The snow is thick In most of the world And children's eyes Are wide As old Saint Nick Gets ready to ride So Feliz Navidad Fashion very cheap And Happy New Year To you Though the customs may change And the language is strange This appeal we feel is real in Holland or Hong Kong It's Christmas time all over the world And places near and far And so my friends wear It's Christmas time all over the world In places near and far And so, my friends, wherever you are Up with a pineapple That's right Fala, Christina Uh-huh Joey, Christmas soup Which means a very merry Christmas To Everybody. Sammy Davis Jr. in festive mood and it's Christmas time all over the world. Well, as you know, I'm in Lapland at the moment, so you're getting a recorded, a recorded, a recorded... No, I must muck you about. A recorded, Rog. Still, I hope you're enjoying it just as well. Two people I know who will be enjoying the programme are Marjorie and Michael Dixon because they're celebrating their 34th wedding anniversary and there's lots of love coming to you, Marjorie and Michael, in Hina in Derbyshire, from Mother Doris. And Doris also wants to say very big thanks for all those people who pop in to see her during the year. I know, Doris, you much appreciate that, don't you? And a letter here that's come from Old Windsor in Berkshire, and absolutely right, because it comes from a very old person. Oh, she'll murder me for saying that. It's Peggy Cottrell. I used to work with Peggy at Cumberland Lodge in Windsor Great Park, which is, I was there as an upmarket redcoat, and Peggy was in charge of all the cleaning, and she was there for 35 years marvellous. Peggy, thanks very much for all that you did and I'll send lots of love to all those people that you worked with and they'll never ever forget you. Now here's a nice piece of music. It takes us back to last Christmas in fact and to Obendorf. It's Enya and Silent Night. <laughs>
the haunting voice of Enya singing Gaelic Silent Night. Do you remember that lovely program last Christmas Day? I'm sure it'll be just exciting tomorrow when we come from Lapland. It's Golden Wedding time again, and it's Golden Wedding anniversary for Reg and Dorothy Hall. And Reg, thanks very much for the letter. And you say, well, I please say to your wife, thank you very much indeed for 50 lovely years of married life. And you're sending love also to your daughters, Jean and Susan, and to your son-in-law's who are both called John, that's handy, isn't it? And to the grandchildren as well. So Reg and Dorothy Hall of St Neots, many congratulations. And this golden wedding, in fact, goes to Spinney Hill in Northampton, and it's Mr and Mrs Tommy Lewin. Thanks very much indeed for your letter, Tommy, and also sending that programme from the Olympia Cinema Cardiff in Queen Street. It doesn't exist anymore. I think it's called the Canon now. But and nice to have memories of Barry as well. Many congratulations. A ruby wedding this time, and it's Ken and Irene Whitehead who live in Bury in Lancashire. Many congratulations. Lovely to get all the stories about your honeymoon as well. That was a very nice letter. Thanks very much indeed, Ken. It's good the men are writing this time. Isn't it excellent? Now listen, a few days ago, I went to visit my guests this morning, Roy and Fiona Castle, as they were preparing for Christmas. So we'll share that after we've listened to Bing Crosby and Frosty the Snowman. And this is especially for Jenny in Monmouth. She'll love it. Frosty the snowman was a jolly happy soul With a corncob pipe and a button nose and eyes made out of coal Frosty the snowman is a fairy tale they say He was made of snow but the children know that he came to life one day There must have been some magic in that old silk hat they found for when they placed it on his head, he began to dance around. The frosty, the snowman, was as live as he could be. And the children say he could laugh and play just the same as you and me. The snowman knew the sun was hot that day So he said, let's run and we'll have some fun Now before I fell away Down to the village with a broomstick in his hand Running here and there all around the square Saying, catch me if you can He led them down the streets of town Right to the traffic cop He only Stop, because old Frosty the snowman, he had to hurry on his way. But he waved goodbye, saying, don't you cry, I'll be back again someday. I'll be back again someday. I'll be back again someday. The unmistakable sounds of the voice of Bing Crosby and Frosty the Snowman. Well, Fiona and Roy Castle, it is kind of you to have me in your house just a short while before Christmas. You're very welcome. It was nice of you to clean the drive. <laughs> <laughs> Fiona, lovely coffee you make. Thanks very much indeed. Listen, how good is Roy about his Christmas presents? Does he like to open them beforehand? No, I don't let him because I hide them. Where on earth can you hide them? I find my places, don't worry. And he doesn't find them? No. That's good. Well, I... he's never told me that he no. has. Oh. <laughs> she hides them under the soap, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Roy, are you looking for anything special from Father Christmas this year? Well, I, I'm hoping for a, a, a really good uh, video recorder. Are you? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I haven't got one. You know, I still haven't got one. Well, you know how to work it when you do get it. Well, that's it. I've got a little bit of time off at Christmas, you see, so I can study the books and find out. And uh, that's what I'm, I'm hoping for, so that I can, uh, I can get down to something serious. Not a new musical instrument? Uh, I think I'm trying to sell those now. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember that super time at Bournemouth when you were on oh, the programme with mm. Chicago Classics? Yes. You were going through all the instruments then. Which is your favourite? Well, it's got to be the trumpet, because I've put more time in at the trumpet. Um, I wish I'd put more, of course, but uh, I play that, I would say, best of, of the instruments that I mess about on. I don't really claim to play any of them as far as musicians are concerned, 
But uh, as, as far as entertainment is concerned, I play a little bit in my cabaret act, you see. And yet you got a standing ovation in Las Vegas with Frank Sinatra in the audience. I know. Well, that's just because I came from his table. I, oh, I, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, sure. So you've warned them. Yeah, yeah. right. You know, I suppose I could have come from his table and played a Coleman paper and people would have applauded, you know. Yeah. But uh, that was a great thrill, yes. yes. Now, Fiona, in the Castle household, what is Christmas like? Bedlam? It is. It's very noisy is it? and chaotic, and we never know who's going to be around. We normally have a lot of people here. You've got four children of your own, haven't you? Yes. Are they all home for Christmas? We hope so, yes. We've got one son who's at the moment in uh, Germany, but he's hoping to be back. And what about the decorating of the house? Who's in charge of that? Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it used to be a combined effort between me and the children, but uh, I've asked the children this year and they're not that keen. Aren't they? They're <laughs> they're it's left to mum. They've grown out of it, you see. Yeah. And also before, uh, coming up to Christmas was murder for, for pa when you're doing pantomimes and things like that because as you're rehearsing and rehearsing and rehearsing, trying to get a few television slots in as well. And uh, so there really isn't any time mm. for, for me to help with all the decorating. Are you glad you don't do pantomime now, bro? Well, I gave up doing it because I realised that I was entertaining everybody's children except my own. Uh, and pantomime, as pantomime, is marvellous. Mm. Uh, it's a really fun thing to do. And theologically very sound. It's the triumph oh. of good over evil. Absolutely. Yes, time. right. Mm. But it's brain damage as well. It's brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> you, you turn up there <laughs> at lunchtime and uh, and you're there all day yeah. and you eat turkey sandwiches and uh, and you can you can smell uh, orange peel and nappies mm. all, all the time mm. you know uh, but it's fabulous it's a lot of fun you always have a lot of fun with everybody in the cast but you really have got to be totally dedicated to the show and you have no private life at all so, Fiona, uh, did you find it difficult when Roy was doing pantomime? I think I found it difficult, but I accepted it because I knew it was what he had to do. Mm. Um, but I did find that he didn't even have time to wrap any presents up at all um, or even consider decorations. And by the time Christmas Day came, he was so exhausted that he hadn't any energy for games mm. or fun at all. Yeah, I'm the only time. Father Christmas who fell asleep at the tree. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, we'll rouse you now because we're giving you a piece of music you've chosen. It's by Paganini and it's Moto Perpetuo.
Roberts and Nicholas Childs playing Paganini's Moto Perpetuo, chosen by my guest this morning, Roy and Fiona Castle. In fact, which one of you chose it? Oh, I chose that one. Uh, Why is that? Really, well, because it's uh, such a virtuoso performance. Uh, these guys are unbelievable. And they're, they're both like uh, front row forwards, you know. <laughs> Little barrels. Uh, oh, they're mar- well, they're big barrels. Very big barrels. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, but lovely fellas and such brilliant players. I mean, they, they they play all over the place. And I've I've been on about three concerts with them. They're such lovely fellas. But th- I mean, you heard that playing. That's that's beyond anything that I could ever do. You see, I've never concentrated on anything sufficiently to do it as well as that. And so do you I've, use music, Roy, though, to relax? Oh yes, yes, I love, I love me all sorts of music if it's good quality, in all forms. I like it. Yes, Fiona. One thing we didn't cover before was what about the food situation at Christmas? At Christmas, I don't make a big fuss about food over Christmas. We tend to be careful anyway about what we eat. We're not big sort of pudding eaters or whatever. So Christmas dinner is always very special, and we've always had Christmas dinner at night candlelit dinner and I've always been really interested in decoration and making it really special for everybody and that's about our lot but we entertain quite a lot just family and friends is it important to you to have friends popping in yes it is we family both enjoy friends, that he says just a few of those about 30 here normally <laughs> isn't it yes well we never know the, the children now that they're older they bring all their waifs and strays in with them you know <laughs> we never know who's going to be here Fiona how did you and Roy meet in the first place well, it was through Eric Morecambe of Morecambe and Wise, yes. They were really good to me over the years. As a starving dancer, I used to go and spend weekends with them and they filled me up so that I could starve for the rest of the week, you know. And one weekend I was there and Roy came on the television and in as casual a way as possible I sort of said, oh, if ever you do a show with Roy, will you introduce me? So Eric just sort of said yes and smirked. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it is a good practical job. <laughs> And I didn't hear anything for, for oh, well over a year. I just thought he'd forgotten. And then he suddenly rang me up and said, I'm doing a television with Roy. Would you like to come along? So, of course, I said yes. And it was on a Sunday. I was in a show in London at the time. And um, I went with Joan, Eric's wife. And he was amazing. He, he took me into Roy's dressing room just before the show started and in typical Eric fashion he just said Roy, this is Fiona, she's in love with you and then left. <laughs> yeah, well, Roy, how did you yeah. react? <laughs> well, I, you see, he'd said to me now, my side of it is... Because we don't gossip on this programme, oh, you know have, that. Yeah. Could have, don't tell anybody oh, this. No. <laughs> but he, he said to me, he said, look, he said, there's this uh, kid dancer, he's a friend of our family and she's a fan of yours uh, he said, I'm bringing her to the show. Be nice to her, you know. There's a good lad. <laughs> <laughs> and all this business. And then, of course, the next thing that happened was he brought her in. He said, this is Fiona, and she's in love with you. And went out, and, and of course, she, she, she had blonde hair in those days, didn't you, darling? And uh, because it, she was in The Sound of Music. She didn't tell you that. She just said a show in sure. the West End, you know. It was the original Sound of Music. That's the only time that in theatre they had black and white. <laughs> And, this was uh, the palace. Yeah, that's right. Mm. Anyway, for uh, for we went out that particular night, and uh, then I dated her gradually and slowly, and um, very slowly. Yes, very oh, slowly. I know. <laughs> but a year later, we were married exactly to the day, and we didn't plan that. But uh, and uh, did uh, Eric and Joan come to the wedding? Oh. Yes, he said he likes, he likes a good laugh. <laughs> well, listen, we'll take you back to your wedding day. We haven't got the cast of The Sound of Music because apparently they actually sang it at your wedding. But instead, we've got the choir and congregation in Manchester Cathedral, very like the cast of The Sound of Music, singing Praise My Soul. Yeah. 
the choir and congregation of Manchester Cathedral singing Praise My Soul, one of the wedding hymns of my guest this morning, Roy and Fiona Castle. Roy, when you did date Fiona and you got married, where were you living at the time? I was living in Sutton, in Surrey, very close to uh, Harry Seacombe. Oh, yeah, of course. course. Yes, and he was best man, of course. Was he? Yes. You he do live best dangerously. Best man at the wedding, yes. <laughs> How super. Yeah. And uh, we're almost related now because uh, I'm godfather to his son, David, and then Jennifer is godmother to my son, Daniel, and, uh, and so on and so forth. And Fiona, did you then give up show business? Yes. Because Did you it, mind doing that? Not really, because I was still associated with it. And I'd always imagined that once I got married, I would give it up. And Roy was working mostly in the States at the time when we got married, doing television over there. And I realised if I pursued my career, we'd see very little of each other, which I didn't think was a good idea. But you don't regret it now? Not at all, no. It would have been better if I'd given it. <laughs> <laughs> but you'd have starved as well then. <laughs> But then bringing up the family, how easy was that? Well, I have to tell you that uh, that strain, that put the strains on, as it, as it does in most families, and that it became very difficult at one, one stage. We had four young children, and Fiona didn't have much help, and Fiona was running the whole scene. I, I, my problem was actually that I suffered from depression for many years, and... Uh, so that I didn't find, although I coped with everything very well because physically I've always had a lot of energy, so that didn't worry me. But emotionally, I think um, I took a lot of strain because um, I felt very isolated because Roy was away such a lot. That's a very important point. I mean, at Christmas time, a heck of a lot of people feel isolated and mm. very much on their own, who yeah. seem to manage well during the rest of the year. Is, is there anything, Fiona, you'd like to say to them, do you think, or any hints you can give them? Well, my life changed radically when somebody pointed out to me that although I'd been going to church all my life, I'd never actually asked Jesus to come into my life. And I'd really been going to church as a ritual rather than as a reality. There hadn't been a much reality there. It was a sort of discipline. And she pointed out that this, it would make a difference. I couldn't imagine that it would at that time. But I was so desperate and I realized that our marriage was failing dismally i was failing dismally i was absolutely at rock bottom thinking well i'll try anything and so i, I took that step and it did it's sometimes change when you life. are at rock bottom that you really you know you reach out and something does mm -hmm. help it was amazing and has that stayed with you since 14 years yes it's just transformed my whole life and what difference do you feel it's made to the two of you as a marriage oh well it uh, it was it was instant repair it was a quick repair job um as far as i'm concerned i felt the same thing i felt it was going away from us i felt that this wonderful thing that we had we had everything we had four lovely children we had a marriage we had a wonderful home and yet it wasn't working something wasn't working and uh, that was me <laughs> <laughs> and, and suddenly fiona disappeared she said i'm going out because somebody had invited her uh, to go and discuss this you see I thought she was going out. I thought, that's it, she's gone. Mm. Oops, now what do we do? And then she came back a half an hour later and it was just like a, a house had been redecorated, completely redecorated, as new. And she was the girl that I was courting uh, in those early days. The one I mean, that, that uh, must have been a fantastic feeling for both of terrific. you. And the children must have mm. felt, you know, mm. isn't this gorgeous uh, to have yeah. a family back like this? Again? And she never said anything to me about it mm. for a month. Then eventually she said, have you noticed any difference in me at all? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> but I'd noticed straight away and I knew exactly what had happened. And it's the finest thing that's ever happened to us as a family. It's wonderful. That's gorgeous to hear. Well, let's enjoy, in fact, is a piece of music that you've chosen, Fiona. I'll hear about it afterwards, but let's listen now to Graham Kendrick's Emmanuel. <laughs> Thank you. 
Kendrick's Emmanuel, chosen by my guest this morning, Fiona Castle, and well backed up by Roy. Fiona, why did you choose that piece of music? Well, I'm a big fan of Graham Kendrick's and his music anyway, and that comes from a, a, a musical called The Gift, and it is, I think, probably the most beautiful music for Christmas that I've heard for a long time. Now, the music of Christmas, how important is that to you, Roy? Well, it's, it's so important to me. My memory of the the real good carols is of a little boy half asleep knowing that Father Christmas was going to come and hardly able to sleep but gradually having to give in and then the brass band of which my granddad was the bandmaster and two of my uncles played in it used to come into our backyard it was I lived in a terraced house mm. And so there were houses all around, and there was one communal backyard where we used to hang the washing on a Monday, good, you know, the good drying yes. day. Yes. And there, they used to come there. To, it would obviously be about 10 or 11 o'clock, which was in the middle of the night to me, and they used to play these lovely carols, the brass band. There's nothing finer than that to me, to hear these carols played in a state of half-sleep. Mm. And... Uh, and that's my memory. And it's whenever still, these are played again... It's still it's very thrilling how the Salvation Army go around playing carols. Mm. They've oh. always taken the message of Christmas onto the streets, haven't yes, they? Haven't yeah. you done a carol concert with the Salvation yes, Army? Yes, yes, yes. I, I was doing it uh, just a few days ago at the Central Hall. And Wexham Park Hospital, have you been to them as well? Yes, yes. I've got uh, their carol concert as well at the hospital. I'm doing all, co- all sorts of carol concerts everywhere now. It's lovely, really. But what about church on Christmas Day, on Monday morning? I mean, where will you be there? Well, we'll be at Gold Hill Baptist Church, which is our normal place of worship. And it is actually going to be televised this year. Yeah, yeah. Live. 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 <laughs> That'll put the skids under you. Definitely tingle time for all our congregation, yeah. I think. Do we know um, which company's televising it? Well, listen now, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but it's the BBC. You are perfectly right. So that's, that's <laughs> absolutely right. We would have allowed the others because it's the season of goodwill. So mm. what sort of service is it going to be? It's just going to be our normal Christmas Day service. I don't think we're making any concessions. And it's going to be filled with children, uh, all the children on Christmas Day 
bring their toys and they're all allowed to sit right up at the front and there's absolute bedlam mm. and our poor pastor is beside himself concerned <laughs> about what he's going to say to these children and if he's going to pick the right one to talk to and whether they'll suddenly go dumb on, on him and he's quite oh, worried oh, about Oh, they it won't. All. Children no. do that. <laughs> oh, Roy, will you be doing anything in the service? Yes, I'm going to be interviewing uh, the people at Rock House, which is just over the road there, the elderly folks who uh, who are attached to the church. Because you're very good with the elderly, aren't you? Oh, well, you see, He's I have a rap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with you. <laughs> Quite right. But you bounced, I mean, for 18 years, you bounced through record breakers, haven't you? Oh, yes, yes. Well, I've been very fortunate there. Um, I know that when, when we started it, I thought, well, if it runs five years, a children's programme, it could run forever because you could start again every five years. You've got new clients out there. Uh, but I didn't really think about it running 18 or... It's, it's actually going on again next year, so we're, that's 19 years. So it would be nice to make the 20 years of it. And, it would uh, be a record-breaker in its own yes, right. Yes, indeed, yes. I've just beaten John Craven now because he stopped doing his news round, and so that was 17 years of news round. So we've, we've, uh, we've just clipped another year onto that one. So uh, I don't know whether I should have stayed that long with the programme or not. But, I mean, it would have been perfectly obvious that they told me to get, uh, to get out of it, wouldn't they, if it hadn't been working? Well, thinking of going for 20 years, I mean, we are coming up now to a new year and a new decade. Fiona, what are your hopes for 1990? Oh, that's a difficult question because obviously one has many hopes. I just um, take one day at a time, actually. I don't plan for the future at all anymore. Well, <laughs> I think this world is going in the right direction now. It's beginning to love each other rather than be wary and hate each other. I think that if that message gets more and more across, that love will, will get the thing sorted out much quicker than hate. Hate will never solve any problem, but love will. Fiona? Roy Castle, thanks very much indeed for letting me come into your home. And may I wish you a very happy Christmas and oh, a very peaceful one. Thank, Thank you. you, and the same to you and all your listeners. They're tuning out the fiddles now, the fiddles now, the fiddles now. There's wine to warm the middles now and get your head a whirl. Around and round the room we go, the room we go, the room we go. Around and round the room we go, so get yourself a girl. Now every heart will start to tingle when sleigh bells jingle on Santa's sleigh. Together we will greet Chris Kringle and another. Merry Christmas polka Let everyone be happy and gay Oh, it's the time to be jolly And deck the halls with holly So let's have a jolly holiday Come on and dance a Merry Christmas polka Another joyous season has begun Kisses beneath the mistletoe Come on and dance 
was the Merry Christmas Polka sung by the Andrews sisters. That reminds me, I must get some liver salts just in case that food in Lapland doesn't agree with me. I pulled a cracker. Hillary allowed me to pull a cracker. And why did the custard cry? Because it saw the apple crumble. <laughs> Never mind. Bushby, no, it must be Bushby, in Wolverhampton in Staffordshire. It's a ruby wedding, and it's Betty and Ken French. Very many congratulations. And you go to Bushby, St Mary's Church there, and apparently you take a lot of people in your car to that church. And Lillian Harris is saying thank you very, very much indeed. And now to Hool in Chester, and it's Hamilton Street Methodist Church in Hool in Chester, and they're having a candlelight carol service at 4 o'clock this afternoon, all right? Christmas Eve, so you can get along to that and prepare properly for Christmas. Days of Christmas sung magnificently by the Geoffrey Mitchell Choir with the English Chamber Orchestra, conducted by a guest from Good Morning Sunday, Edward Heath. I think he's known for other things as well, but mainly as a former guest on Good Morning Sunday. Mrs. Ada Hartfield, I've had a very, very nice letter from your daughter, Philippa, and she said that it would have been on Christmas Eve your 
Ruby wedding will again, you know, still make it special despite the sadness. And you've had, you've coped brilliantly apparently with moving home from Nottinghamshire to the Abbey Field House in Gloucester. And you were at that lovely service at Gloucester Cathedral when I was preaching to the uh, Mother's Union. Actually, I was there for the guides as well. Gloucester Cathedral is gorgeous, isn't it, Ada? It's absolutely beautiful. Well, Give yourself a special treat. Go and have a look at that cathedral this East, this Christmas. I'm getting my festivals muddled up. <laughs> now it's to Mum and Dad, Nanny and Granddad, because it's Elsie and Ted Oliver. And they're having great celebrations today because yesterday was their golden wedding anniversary. And there's lots of love to you, Elsie and Ted, from Chris and Ian, Dorothy and John, Paul, Adrian, Karen, Anita, Kerry, and Jonathan Lockyer, your grandson. So very, very many congratulations. And I've got it after 8.30, so that's perfectly all right. And it'll be a lovely carol that's coming up for you. Jim Humphreys from Zeal in Warminster, thanks very much for your letter. You make a tape for the housebound, and it's a very worthwhile thing to do. I'll also send very good wishes to Miss Mari Humphreys, who is your sister, who will be spending Christmas with you. And here is the very glorious voice of Jesse Norman and the Coventry Carol.
wasn't that gorgeous? Jesse Norman and the Coventry Carol. George and Kathleen Riles of Plymouth celebrating your golden wedding anniversary. Very, very many congratulations. I hope it's a lovely service today at St. Francis Church. And there's lots of love coming to you from Ken, Margaret, David, Robert, Colin, their respective wives and husbands, and from the great grandchildren as well. And Viva Quinlan from Wimborne in Dorset, thanks very much indeed for your letter, and I'll willingly send gris- Christmas greetings to all your family and friends, and thanks very much indeed for the poem that you sent me. And Jean Greenaway, who lives in Kikoldi in Scotland, Many congratulations, very good wishes to you on your 80th birthday and there's lots of love coming from your sister, Anne, and she says you're a marvellous, marvellous sister. You can't ask for more than that at Christmas time, can you? A diamond wedding for Mr and Mrs Mallin, who live in Hinkley in Leicestershire, and for 57 years, Mr Mallin, Bill, has been the choir master at the village chapel. Many, many congratulations to Bill and Ruby, lots and lots of love, and have a very happy Christmas, and I hope the choir sing well. And Eunice Ritico of Warrington, thanks ever so much for your letter. I hope it'll be a special Christmas for you, even with a touch of sadness as well. Well, it's time to say my thanks, isn't it, to my guests this morning, Roy and Fiona Castle, and also to General Eva Burrows and to all members of the Salvation Army. Good work. Keep it going, particularly over this Christmas. To my researcher, Babette McFarlane, and my producer, Hilary Mayo. Can I also say very many thanks for the many cards that you've sent, not only to me, but the rest of the team who make up Good Morning Sunday week by week. You really are super. Not only are you paying the postage, but you're buying the cards as well. And I know some of you are on very limited incomes. It's kind of you to be so generous in thinking of us at this time. The hymn takes us back to Advent because we're still in that Advent season till tomorrow when I join you from Lapland. It's O Come, O Come Emmanuel.
And don't forget, you can join Roger Royal tomorrow, Christmas morning, here on Radio 2 at 8 o'clock, when he'll be coming to you live from Lapland. And tonight we can share that moment when Christmas Eve gives way to Christmas Day with the Chapter House Choir of York Minster as they bring us carols from the Chapter House at 11 o'clock. Christmas Day begins at York Minster tonight on Radio 2. <laughs>